right, folks. We're going to be starting earlier because, well, we are full. So, what's the point of waiting? Is it? All right. Um, so, uh, welcome to the uh, ECS uh, Departmental Colloquium. We are super happy to have Professor Jan Lecon uh, with us today. Uh, Jan did uh, his PhD at uh, Sorbonne in Paris, and he then uh, went on to work for. Uh, he went on to be a, a postdoc with Jeff Hinton in Toronto, and then went on to have an illustrious career in Bell Labs, the best ever um, uh, uh, research lab, until it fell apart. But it got res res resurrected by Young in the guise of Facebook uh, Fair uh, Research, uh, who was a, uh, Young was a co founder of uh, FAIR, uh, Facebook FAIR um, Research Lab, uh, and also the, the uh, Data Science, and NYU Data Science Center. And uh, of course, Jan is a co-recipient uh, uh, of the Turing Award together with uh, Jeff Hinton and, and Joshua, uh, Joshua Benjo. And, and the thing about Jan is um, he is a great uh, philosopher of the 20th century, Isaiah Berlin, talked about uh, the two kind of, 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 of thinkers, the, the hedgehogs and the foxes. A fox, said Isaiah Berlin, knows many things, but a hedgehog knows one big thing. Jan is definitely a hedgehog, and he has been focused on the one thing for a very, very long time. It's really a history of, of not giving up despite everything. And Jan's first uh, working system, convolutional neural network, was done in 1989, and it, were, it was solving a real problem, digit recognition. It was used in a post office somewhere in, 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 in New Jersey, I think. And since that time, Jan was pushing this for a long time, and frankly, most of us didn't, didn't pay attention. And I remember Jan was here in 2000 when I was a grad student. He was showing a live demo on a ginormous laptop, a live demo. And we're like, oh, this is pretty cool, but you know, I, we don't understand how it works, so OK, you know. And, and, and really, most people would have given up, but, but Jan didn't. And in fact, the, you know, the, the, the Krzyzewski Hinton implementation of AlexNet is essentially that very 1989 network just you know scaled up with GPUs. Other than that, it's basically exact, exactly identical. And so that is one big thing. But you know, don't make think, don't think that Jan is like one one horse pony because Jan, you know, when he does things, he does it right. So not only does he write, he create the ConvNet implementation, but he thought that you know. For this, you need to have a proper programming language. So he wrote a programming language. Then he wrote the compiler for the programming language. And then he realized that actually the, 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 the chips were wrong. So he designed a chip to run the compiler, to run his programming language, to run the, the component. So Jan is a full stack and an amazing storyteller and a wonderful person. We're so happy to have him here. Jan Likon. Thank you, Arisha. Thank you so much, Alyosha. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun uh, in those various uh, computer vision workshops that you and I participated in, uh, and Jitendra, and a few other people here. Um, and uh, when I was at Bell Labs, uh, when I joined Bell Labs in 1988, um, I was in the, uh, the next aisle to Jeff. Um, and, uh, you know, even at the time he was loud, we could hear him from. Why not over? <laughs> okay, um, from machine learning to autonomous intelligence. Okay, so this is uh, essentially sort of a, a quick uh, explanation of some long uh, position paper that I, I wrote and I put on open review uh, uh, recently, a few months ago. And uh, you have the address here. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's not a a traditional talk in the, in the sense that I'm not going to give you know, results on stuff I've done. It's more like what I think people should be working on and where things are going, what I think are the most interesting problems to work on. So a lot of it is speculation. 
Uh, and this is what you get to do when you win a Turing Award. <laughs> or just when you pass 60 years old. Um, OK, machine learning sucks. <laughs> At least compared to humans and animals. So uh, supervised learning, which is what almost everybody is using to build particular applications of machine learning, requires enormous amounts of label samples. Reinforcement learning requires insane amounts of trials. And I apologize for all half the people in the room here who work on reinforcement learning. Um, but, um, and, and they tend to be kind of brittle because they, they're trained on, you know, for kind of specific tasks and everything. So they make stupid mistakes. Uh, machines don't have common sense. This is not a new problem. People have been talking about this since the 1950s. Uh, you know, Animals and humans can learn new tasks extremely quickly. They can rely on their background knowledge for that. Uh, and that background knowledge perhaps constitutes what we call common sense. And the reason they can learn things, we can learn things really quickly is because uh, we kind of have some understanding of how the world works. Um, so how do we get machines to understand how the world works? Um, <clears throat> here is another problem. Most machine learning systems, not all of them, but many of them, have basically a constant number of computational steps between input and output. And this is not really what reasoning is that we think of as reasoning, right? Uh, a, a process of reasoning has kind of an unbounded uh, uh, number of steps, uh, essentially. And current crops of uh, deep learning architectures uh, do not plan. So this is not a limitation of deep learning. It's a limitation of the type of architectures we're using. And I'll, I'll come to this in a minute. So humans and many animals understand how the world works. They can predict the consequences of their actions. They can perform change of reasoning with an unlimited number of steps, at least for some animals. They can pl plan complex uh, tasks by decomposing them into sequences of subtasks. And pretty much all animals can do this you know, above a certain level in the uh, evolutionary ladder. So uh, how is it that humans and animal, uh, animals learn so quickly? Um, and if you go to, uh, you know, try to figure out at what age babies learn basic uh, concepts. You know, some of them might be innate, we don't know, but, but many of them seem to be learned. And uh, babies learn things like uh, the difference between animate and inanimate object pretty early, probably around three months. Uh, object permanence probably pops up earlier than that. Uh, the emergence of natural categories uh, kind of, you know, happens pretty, pretty quickly. And then things like gravity, inertia, conservation of momentum, sort of intuitive physics, uh, pops up around the age of nine months or so. So if you show the, the scenario at the bottom here, where a little car is on the platform, is pushed off the platform and appears to float in the air, uh, a six-month-old baby will barely pay attention. But a 10-month-old baby will go that the little girl in the, in the center here be really surprised and pay attention because um, you know, her model of the world was uh, just violated. We tend to pay attention to things that violate our predictions, our model of the world. So perhaps um, you know, it's the collection of, of background knowledge that we acquire when we're babies that constitute the basis of what we call common sense and what allows us to when we're teenagers, for example, to learn to drive a car with something like 20 hours of practice, hardly without causing any accident. Whereas if you were to use uh, current uh, uh, reinforcement learning techniques to take a random example, uh, a car would have to run off cliffs multiple times before it realizes it's a bad idea, <laughs> uh, probably thousands of times, and then another few thousands of times before it realizes how not to run off the cliff. And then if it sees another cliff, it would have to also run off that cliff and learn. <laughs> so, you know, how do we uh, solve that problem? And it's, it's a practical problem because we really want machines with common sense. We want uh, self-driving cars. We want domestic robots. We want intelligent virtual assistants. Um, so, you know, how, how, do, how do babies learn? So a lot of learning is basically just observation. And there is an advantage to being able to learn as much as you can through observation only, because any action you take takes time, requires uh, energy, and also can kill you. So 
how much can we learn just by observing the world? Can we learn how the world works by observing the world? Uh, and that's the big question. And what I'm hoping to uh, uh, kind of put ourselves on the path uh, to solve here is those three problems. Um, so the three, the three challenges in AI and machine learning that I think are the most important. Learning representations and predictive models for the world, not in supervised mode or reinforcement mode, but basically by watching. Um, and so that leads to this idea of self-supervised learning, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, learning to reason, so um, not just sort of computing an output from an input in a fixed number of steps, but basically sort of infer things. Um, so Daniel Kahneman, uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, psychologist, although he's Nobel Prize in economics, uh, calls his system two, so the kind of you know, reasoning, deliberate conscious reasoning that you do as opposed to system one, which is sort of subconscious. Uh, but we have to make reasoning compatible with deep learning because deep learning, you know, the idea of kind of optimizing objective functions by gradient-based method is really powerful. And, and so the big question is, we're not gonna slap some sort of, uh, you know, logic-based reasoning on top of neural net because we don't know how to back propagate gradient through logic reasoning. Um, and then perhaps uh, with this, we might be able to figure out how to build machines that can plan complex action sequences, probably hierarchically. Uh, now, I stole this from Jitendra. He gave a talk recently uh, by video, so I could do a screen capture. Uh, and uh, he, he dug out this, uh, this book here. He's very good for dugging things out, <laughs> particularly old things. Uh, by a psychologist, uh, Kenneth Craig, who, who, who claimed that common sense is a collection of models as opposed to just a bunch of facts, right? It's, it's really models. Um, so um, a lot of people, I'm sure, have seen this um, joke, which is uh, connected with what I just said in the sense that uh, when a system is trained through reinforcement learning, the type of feedback that the machine gets is very weak and very poor in terms of quantity of information because it's one value uh, once in a while. Uh, and so necessarily the number of trials you have to do to, to learn anything is going to be very large. Supervised learning is a little better in the sense that uh, every sample gives you a few bits of information. But it has to be produced by humans um, and, and so necessarily it's limited in terms of quantity. Um, and then self-supervised learning uh, would be, you know, the way you train very, very large networks um, and uh, by essentially predicting everything from everything else. So you have an input, you don't have outputs, or you may have outputs, but really you are sort of trying to train a system to figure out the dependencies between various inputs. And what you get out of this is that every sample now is several million bits. Maybe it's a whole video. Uh, and, and you're asking the system to predict what's in, what's in the, the future of the video, for example. Okay, um, so the problem is set, and now uh, let's talk about um, an architecture that could be a, like a proposal for an arch architecture for autonomous AI systems with all the components that it requires. There's not much new in this architecture. A lot of it has been talked about and published uh, and proposed by sort of various people in different contexts. Um, in cognitive science, neuroscience, machine learning, reinforcement learning, etc. But the basic architecture is, the centerpiece of it is a world model. So a world model is uh, a module that allows the system to predict some representation of the state of the world at time t plus one from a representation of the state of the world at time t and perhaps a bunch of latent variables and perhaps an action that the agent would take, okay? So I have some idea of the, of the state of the world. I imagine an action I might take, and I'm predicting the future state of the world that will result from it. Okay, so that's the world model. Um, and, and we can ro roll out this world model multiple steps. So imagine a future that will uh, result from taking a sequence of actions. That sequence of action would be proposed by the actor, the, the yellow module here. Um, and all of this goes into the state of the world model, goes into uh, a cost module, which basically computes the degree of discomfort of the agent. So think of it as a cost function, uh, which is composed of two, two sub-modules that I'll come to in a minute. And 
This cost function basically is what drives the behavior of the system. This is not a cost function that is minimized by learning. It's a cost function that is minimized by inference. So basically, the purpose of the system is to make itself happy, which means minimize this, this cost function by finding a sequence of action that the world model will predict will result in a good outcome, where good is defined by this cost function. Okay? Um, so basically, um, think of it as some inference process where the system tries to find a sequence of actions that minimize the, minimizes the cost. I haven't talked about learning yet. Uh, the state of the world is stored in some working memory or short-term memory. There's a perception module that computes an estimate of the state of the world. And then there's this mysterious configurator at the top, which I'll talk about at the end. OK, there's two ways to use a system like this. The first one is just reactive, so a perception action cycle, where the system uh, perceives the, the input from the sensor, runs it through the perception system that's called the encoder here, estimates the state of the world, perhaps combining it with some previous states stored in the memory, and then directly produces an action through uh, what's called a policy network, which is this little green uh, module here uh, in the actor, and then acts directly on the world. So this is reactive subconscious, if you want. Uh, but what's a little more interesting is mode two uh, perception planning action cycle, which is very much similar to what optimal control theories call uh, model predictive control. In fact, it's exactly the same thing. So here, what you do is you roll out a sequence of, uh, uh, you, you sort of run your world model. Think of it as a kind of a simulator of the real world. Okay, but it's, it's learned, some neural net. Uh, together with a proposed sequence of actions, and then predict what's gonna happen in the world as a result of taking this sequence of actions. So this is all in, in, in the head of the system, not, not actually, uh, no action is being taken at this point. And then the cost module uh, measures the cost of uh, either the end state or, or the sequence. Um, and what the actor does is, uh, through some inference process, tries to figure out some optimization process, tries to figure out the sequence of action that minimizes the cost. Okay, if the actions are continuous, you can use gradient-based methods. All of those modules are differentiable. They're all part of the system. They're all neural nets. You can, you know, um, backpropagate gradients uh, all the way through. And that's sort of, you know, gradient-based uh, model predictive control, very classical in uh, optimal control. Uh, a lot of people actually, you know, here have been sort of working with models of this type. Uh, uh, you know, people at, at Bayer, for example, uh, Daniel Hafner and his collaborators and, and various other people. Uh, those are all people, uh, except for the first one, which is from my lab, the other ones are from, all from Berkeley. Um, so once the optimal sequence of action that minimizes the cost is, uh, is figured out, then you, the system sends the first action to the world and then resumes the, the planning uh, procedure. So very simple, there's a way to uh, so this is, you know, the equivalent of a conscious task, right? You're sort of paying attention using your, your predictive world model to kind of imagine possible scenarios and then sort of plan a sequence of actions to arrive at a particular goal. Let's say you're building a widget or something, you have to do some planning and sort of imagine what the result will be of, you know, cutting planks and putting them together, things like that. Uh, but for basically any action, you know, that includes, uh, I don't know, a wolf, uh, wolf bag, you know, hunting or whatever. They need to do some planning. Um, there is a way to turn uh, a task of this type, a deliberate planning task uh, that is repeatedly uh, done into sort of a more subconscious automatic uh, task by using the optimal actions obtained through model predictive controls as target values for the policy network. So basically you can have a cost function here that you use to train a policy network to predict what the optimal action will be without actually going through the, the whole machinery of the uh, world model and planning. And so, um, I mean, there are situations like this where even for tasks that are extremely sort of appear combinator combinatorial, like playing chess, uh, very good chess players, if they play against, uh, you know, people like me who don't play chess very well, uh, they don't have to think about it, right? I mean, they come in front of it and in two seconds they can play, they can just recognize the pattern and play directly, so that task has become subconscious. Don't use, they don't need to use their predictive world model to figure out possible scenarios. 
they can play reactively. <coughs> and it's the same with driving. The first few hours you, um, you drive, you learn to drive, you have to completely focus on the task. Nobody can talk to you and distract you. And then after maybe 50 hours of practice, you can do this automatically and hold a conversation at the same time. Okay, so this cost module will have to be composed of multiple submodules, at least two. One, uh, which is, which I call the intrinsic cost, and this one is hardwired. So the intrinsic cost is hardwired. It basically determines the, 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 the nature of the agent. Uh, it computes things like, uh, you know, the equivalent of things like, you know, pain and pleasure and hunger and things like that, like very sort of um, uh, hardwired things, but, as, but it also encodes um, uh, costs that will drive the system to learn the right thing. So you can imagine, for example, that babies that are around uh, 10 months old or so, uh, you know, like, they like to stand up. And probably there is some sort of thing in their brain that drives them to want to stand up and makes them happy to stand up. Uh, because that's what drives babies to learn to, um, to walk eventually. So that's one part of the, the cost, the intrinsic cost. This is where you, you would put uh, uh, safety mechanisms to prevent, for example, an uh, AI system or robot from you know, killing people or whatever, doing bad things, right? You put sort of safeguards in the form of cost functions there. It's much easier to specify this, this in the form of cost modules than in the form of a hardwired behavior, which is much more complicated to specify, uh, to program. And then the second part of the cost is a trainable uh, cost or critic, which basically, whose purpose is to basically predict future values of the intrinsic cost. Um, and this is sort of a classical thing in reinforcement learning, right, where um, you can have a, a memory that remembers states and actions and corresponding costs, um, and you know, more like have like some sort of buffer of past, uh, uh, past states. And then you can train the, the critic module to predict future values of the cost. You know, once you've waited for a bit using a previous state, you can train it to predict uh, you know, a, a value of the cost, that uh, intrinsic cost that happens in the future or some discounted future version of it. Um, and, uh, and therefore have now a cost function that is not such an immediate uh, uh, instantaneous uh, uh, cost, but predicts ahead what's going to happen. Okay, so we come to basically the, the crux of the, of, the, of the thing here, which is building and training the world model. So the problem with the world is that it's not entirely predictable, first of all. It's not necessarily deterministic, but even if it's deterministic, it's not completely predictable. So let's say I do an experiment where I put a pen on the table, I let it go. It, you know, every time I repeat the experiment, the pen is going to fall in a different direction. And so if I train a neural net, you know, a deterministic parameterized function to make a single prediction, the best thing it can do if I train it with least square is predict the average of all the possible outcomes, which would be sort of a transparent pen along all directions. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. If you train a, a convolutional net, let's say, to predict what's going to happen in a video, uh, it makes a blurry predictions. So this is uh, a, a video. We initialize the system with the first frame, and we, we train some big convolutional net to predict what, what happens here. This is actually a top-down view of a highway around a, a car. And the predictions it makes are blurry, right? So the, the cars around it sort of become blurry. Because it really doesn't know what's going to happen. Are the cars going to accelerate or, or break or whatever? Same if you do natural videos. Uh, you try to predict the next frames, and they're blurry because the system doesn't know really what's cannot possibly predict what's going to happen. Um, so we're going to have to find a way to get those world models to handle uncertainty in the prediction. And I'm going to have to, and this is where I come to self supervised learning. So, and I'm, I'm going to um, ask you to give up on two things, which are the two main pillars of machine learning. One is uh, generative models. I'm going to argue that we must abandon them. And the second one is uh, probabilistic modeling. We also need to abandon that, okay? That's a tougher one. Um, the third thing I'm gonna ask to abandon is contrastive learning, but we'll come to this in a second. So, so what is self-supervised learning? So self-supervised learning is, uh, you, you have a piece of data, let's say, for the sake of simplicity, a video. Uh, you mask some of it, so you pretend there is a piece of it that you don't know. And then you train the system to predict the part that, that 
you pretend it doesn't know from the part that is visible, okay? So observe a piece of video and train a system to predict the future in that video, the next video uh, clip. Or you can ask it to retrodict, so predict the past, or to predict sort of things in the middle, the left from the right, whatever. And of course you can do this by you know, unmasking. But we have to use uh, representations that, um, that handle uncertainty. And for this, uh, I'm recommending to abandon probabilistic, probabilistic modeling and use something called energy-based models, which you can think of as a sort of more general framework for representing uncertainty, uh, but weaker in uh, th theoretical terms. So what is an energy-based model? An energy-based model is an energy function. So it's an implicit function. Instead of predicting y from x, we're going to, have, uh, we're going to uh, build and train a function, f of xy, that is going to give us low values when x and y are compatible, and then higher values when they're not. So if y is a good continuation for the video clip uh, x, then we should get a low value for f of xy, otherwise a higher value. So let's say we have something like this, where x and y are both uh, scalar uh, variables, and our data samples are, are those black dots. Okay, this is our training set, if you want. We'd like our, our model to give low energy to um, the training samples and regions around, and then higher energy outside, right? Um, so I'm not talking about learning yet, okay? We're gonna learn this energy function, but for now we're just talking about uh, inference. And so that allows the system to represent multimodality because there might be multiple y's that are compatible with a given x. In fact, in this little diagram that I showed, uh, for a given x, uh, let's say if x has this value, there is you know, three possible values for y. For here, there is essentially an infinite number of values here and then another one there. Um, so think of it as kind of a weaker form of distribution, but it doesn't need to be normalized. Okay, it's just a contrast function. Um, and a lot of classical algorithms can be sort of interpreted in this context that, that are not, you know, things like k-means, for example. Uh, there are two forms of energy-based models, conditional ones where you know in advance which part is observed. Okay, for example, you're doing video prediction, but there is the sort of unconditional one where there is only a y, there is no x, so parts of y might be observed, but you don't know in advance which part will be observed, so you can't tell what is x, what is y in advance. Uh, you can turn energy-based models into probabilistic models if you're lucky. So if, uh, so this is a Gibbs distribution formula. Uh, you take e to the minus the energy. This is a standard stuff in physics, right? And uh, with a beta parameter, it's just a coolness uh, parameter. Um, no, it is coolness. Yeah, it's called coolness. <laughs> it's inverse temperature, okay? Um, and then you normalize. And the problem, of course, is this. We don't know how to compute this for any a decently interesting form for F, this is not tractable. And so the idea of energy-based model is forget about this altogether. Okay, just train the energy function so that it takes low energy on stuff you want and higher energy outside without insisting necessarily that those energies be, be logarithms of uh, normalized probabilities. Um, you can have latent variables in energy-based models. So I can define an energy-based model f of x, y, uh, which in fact is the minimum over a latent variable z of some other function e of x, y, z. Okay, so maybe I find uh, the z that minimizes this, this energy for a given x and y, and if I plug this into e, I get f of x, y. Now the, the z disappears, right? Um, and that's very useful for a lot of different things, which I'll come to in a second. Okay, how do we train an energy-based model? There are two methods, and both methods uh, are there to prevent collapse. What's the collapse? So if I have um, an energy function that's parameterized and very kind of flexible, if you want, I can, and those are my training samples, I can just pull down on the training samples, so basically tweak the parameters of the energy for every training sample I get so that the energy of the training sample goes down, right? So I'm just pulling down on, the, on those samples. There's nothing that prevents this energy function from becoming completely flat, and that would be a very bad model because it would give basically zero energy to everything. So what I need to do is have some way, some prescription to make sure that the energy outside of the training samples that I have is higher. 
So the first set of methods is contrastive, and I'm going to argue against that. Okay, they're very popular at the moment. Uh, the, basically, all uh, probabilistic maximum likelihood method that use Monte Carlo method are contrastive methods. GANs are contrastive methods. Uh, BERT is a contrastive method. So denoising autoencoders are contrastive methods. So all those things. Siamese nets use contrastive methods. So very popular at the moment. And I say, stay away from it. Um, so the idea there is uh, you pull down on, the, on those data points. And then you generate other points, the, the, blue, the, the, the green points, and you, you push them up. Okay, and so necessarily the energy surface is going to take the right shape. And then there's another set of methods which I'm going to argue for. Regularized method. And the idea of regularized methods is that you have some term in your loss function that you minimize during training or your energy function for your system that somehow minimizes the volume of stuff that can take low energy. Okay, so essentially because there is only a limited amount of things that can, they can have low energy, just by pulling down on a data point, you make the energy of everything else high because there's just a limited volume. This connects with some ideas that Yi has, Yima has been uh, working on, I'll come back to this. Um, okay, so let's go through a, a bunch of standard architectures and see if they can collapse or not. So uh, a neural net, you know, parameterized function, here I put two of them, but doesn't matter, that minimizes a prediction error with a target um, that cannot collapse. It cannot collapse because for any x, there is only one value of y that can have uh, low energy, uh, or one value of y tilde that can have low energy, and it's when y tilde is equal to y if this is a divergence or distance function. Okay, so this cannot collapse. Um, the volume of uh, of why they can take low energy here is reduced to one point. But the problem with this architecture is that it doesn't handle uncertainty in the prediction, right? It can only predict one thing. Um, latent variable model. So a latent variable model is one in which there is a latent variable that can, whose value can vary over a set, and when this, or can be drawn from a distribution, but let's say it varies over a set. When we va vary this latent variable over a set, the prediction varies over another set. Uh, and um, and the, the, the distance here, so if I give you an x and a y, I ask you what is the value of z within this set that will minimize the prediction error, okay? And that's your energy, that's the energy of the system, okay? I'm coming back to the idea previously explained that when you have a latent variable model, you minimize the energy with respect to the latent variable for a given pair uh, x, y, okay? This can collapse, and the reason it can collapse is that if z, for example, has the same dimension as y, and the predictor here is not degenerate, then, um, then for any pair x, y, there is going to be a value of z that makes this prediction error zero, which means the entire space of y for, for any x has zero energy, okay? So if I want to prevent this, perhaps using a regularization method, I have to limit the information content of Z. I have to limit the number of different configurations that Z can take. I have to limit the volume of space that it can uh, vary over or do something like that, right? So I need some regularization here of the latent variable if I don't want this model to collapse. Um, in probabilistic model, this regularization would be done by turning z into a fuzzy variable and maximizing the entropy of that distribution. But there are many other ways to do it. A good way to do it, for example, for the Bruno Olsas and fans in the lab, in the, in the room, is to make z sparse. That's sparse coding. It prevents collapse. An autoencoder can collapse. If I, uh, so an autoencoder is unconditional. There's no x. I just give you a y, run through an encoder and a decoder, uh, measure the reconstruction error, and if SY has the same dimension as Y, um, this can learn the identity function and therefore collapse and produce a flat energy surface where everything is perfectly reconstructed. And that's a bad model. So the way you want an autoencoder to work is that you want it to perfectly reconstruct stuff you train it on and then not reconstruct stuff you don't train it on. Okay, and that's the hard part. You can do this by limiting the information content of SY or by other tricks like contrastive method like a denoising autoencoder. Um, and then finally, another architecture which I'm going to argue for, 
called joint embedding. So in joint embedding, um, a specific example of this is Siamese networks. Uh, you, you feed both X and Y into encoders, and then you basically try to make SY predictable from SX or simply make SX and XY equal for X and Y that are compatible. Okay? And of course, they have to be non-equal for X and Ys that are not compatible, and that's the hard part. This can collapse because the system may choose to ignore the inputs, make SX and XY constant and equal, and now your energy is zero everywhere, and your model doesn't do anything for you. Okay, so what, how are we going to prevent those things from collapsing? Now, those collapsing prevention, you never hear about this in uh, probabilistic models because probabilistic models need to be normalized and that's actually how they don't collapse. But at a cost, that's just not worth it. Um, okay, so two classes of methods. Uh, let's say we have data points here we have a region of low energy here that we start with, and those, uh, this region should take lower energy and this region probably higher energy. Um, contrasting method, we're gonna generate uh, those, those green points and then push their energy up to some cost function. And regularized method, we're just going to minimize the volume of stuff that can take low energy in some way. So contrasting methods have actually become quite popular in recent uh, times for things like uh, metric learning or semis nets and things like that. Um, and uh, here is a eye chart. Uh, it's a list of a whole bunch of standard methods classified as to whether they are, I think of them as contrastive or non-contrastive. So any maximum likelihood method that uses Monte Carlo, Marco Chen Monte Carlo, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, is contrastive. Contrastive divergence even has it in the name. Metric learning side is nets in the classical form. Uh, uh, minimum probability flow, adversarial, uh, uh, you know, GANs, uh, denoising autoencoders, masked autoencoder, which is a special case of denoising autoencoder, etc. Uh, and then in regularized methods, we have things like uh, uh, square ICA, um, PCA. And then more interesting ones, uh, sparse uh, autoencoders and sparse coding, uh, variational autoencoders and, and, and quantizing uh, autoencoders, and then saturating autoencoders, and then sort of newer methods, which I'm gonna uh, focus on, uh, things like uh, Barlow twins and Vicrag, which uh, are pl applicable to uh, joint embedding architectures. So I'm gonna go super quickly on contrastive methods because I think they're doomed. Um, but very popular at the moment for training uh, uh, joint embedding architectures, Siamese nets in particular, and very often the, the, the objective function that is used takes energies of a bunch of different points. So you have a bunch of X's, a bunch of Y's, uh, and then contrastive samples, these are, which are those Y hats, uh, and you feed the energies of all of those things into an, uh, a loss function and sort of minimize the source function with respect to the parameters of, of, uh, of, of the energy function E or F, uh, depending on whether there is latent variables or not. Here's a, a big list of different loss functions you can use. The ones that people use most of the time is, uh, is actually uh, this one uh, at the top. So it's, gonna, it's a log softmax, uh, if you recognize it, um, sometimes called info NCE. Uh, this is only for pairs of samples, but uh, info NCE actually, which is used for um, Siamese nets, uh, uses a collection of points, usually one positive pair and a bunch of negative samples, and you plug them into a log softmax so that the energy of the compatible pair XY goes down, and the energies of everything else, which is at the, at the bottom, all the negative pairs, goes up. Uh, but this is just one example. Uh, now, let me skip this. So this is, uh, I'll tell you the punchline without actually explaining. Uh, this is to say that probabilistic modeling sucks. And it's because it pushes the energy surface to be basically a golf course or a very deep canyon. Uh, so if you have uh, a piece of data that is a, th a very thin manifold, a thin plate, the probabilistic modeling will want to give infinite probability to the manifold and zero probability to everything else outside. And the only way you can do this with energy is to give 
uh, minimum energy on the manifold and then infinite energy just outside. And so you get a very deep trench. And that's not a good way to do inference because there is no usable gradient in that loss function. So you would need to regularize it, which means you need to make it non-probabilistic in the end. GANs are contrastive methods. Denoising autoencoders are contrastive methods. And they work really well for text. Um, so we all know about BERT, right? Uh, take a piece of text, remove some of the words, so corrupt it in some way, and then run it through an autoencoder so uh, and train the autoencoder to recover the missing parts of the, of the text. Uh, and uh, that's been incredibly successful in NLP and basically caused a revolution over the last uh, few years in uh, NLP. Um, and, you know, lots of really fun stuff you can do with this, you know, large language models and train them uh, multi, multiple tasks and multiple languages, and you can get them to generate funny dialogues with the Statue of Liberty. Uh, you can use uh, those pre-trained models also for uh, translating lots of languages between them. So this is a project called uh, No Language Left Behind at, uh, at FAIR, uh, which can translate um, 202 languages any direction, so over 40,000 40, directions. And it's trained on uh, 18 billion pairs of sentences from only 2,400 language directions. So it's very sparse. Uh, but because of the commonality of human languages, uh, this works actually really well. It's a relatively small model with 50 billion, 54 billion parameters. It's amazing that we said it's, it's small now. But, um, and it, it can deal with a lot of languages, some of which I have no idea what they are. Uh, that's 200 languages. Um, I know about Luxembourgish, but um, but a lot of those languages have no idea where they come from. Um, okay, so an idea that some people here at Berkeley had a long time ago was why don't we apply this idea to images? Take an image, block out some pieces of it, train some autoencoder to recover the missing pieces. Um, I think you were involved. Uh, it was Deepak Patak and when he was a postdoc here, I guess. Um, it was two PhD students, sorry. Uh, and it doesn't work very well. <laughs> I mean, you sort of get some features here, right? Yes, yes, pioneering work, but it doesn't work very well. And and the reason is, it's it's very hard to predict a piece of image or an image. Uh, with uncertainty. So those systems can only make one prediction and it makes a prediction that's somewhat blurry because you know, there is no unique way of filling in the blanks in, a, in an image. It's very easy to do with text because text is discrete. So if you have a discrete number of atoms, you can compute a distribution of a discrete number of atoms with a big softmax. But if you have continuous stuff, you, you can't. So you pre-train something like this and then you find you need on ImageNet and you get like 40% correct or something which at the time was, yeah, and now is. <laughs> OK, so what EBM architectures are we going to use for a multimodal prediction? And I'm going to argue for this joint embedding predictive architecture. Uh, so, so basically, arguing against this, which is a generative model. So a generative model is something that predicts y directly, OK? Perhaps with the help of a latent variable if you want uh, uncertainty and replace it by this joint embedding where you encode both x and y. Why is that a good idea? It's a good idea because let's imagine that x and y are you know, natural video clips. Um, it could be that, um, let's say there are you know, videos from a dashboard camera of a car you know, driving along uh, a road. Driving along the road, there might be uh, trees, and there is wind today, so the leaves of the trees are moving. And then behind the tree, there's a pond and there's ripples on the pond. If you use a generative model, you have to predict every single detail of that image. The leaves, the ripples, everything, OK? You might fold this into a latent variable, but the latent variable will have to be really big, high capacity. Whereas here, you could imagine having this encoder basically eliminate all the uh, details that are just too hard to represent or predict. So everything that is not predictable will be eliminated by this encoder. And the prediction will be done in the space of representations where all of those details have been eliminated. 
Okay, that seems like a more rational thing to do, at least to me. Okay, so I already asked you to abandon probabilistic modeling, and I'm asking you to abandon generative models, whether they are probabilistic or not. Now, of course, we need latent variables to represent uncertainty, and uh, let me skip this. Actually, this is sparse coding stuff, and you know, it's also Bruno, but he's teaching a class, so I don't have to show it. Um, <laughs> So there are sort of several uh, types of uh, joint embedding architecture. The simplest one, which is similar to what people um, that have called Siamese nets, uh, kind of deterministic but predictive architectures, where basically you insist that the representation of Y be predictable from the re representation of X with a deterministic function. And then the sort of probabilistic version, the non-probabilistic but non-deterministic version of this, where um, uh, you insist that SY be predictable from SX, but perhaps with the help of a latent variable, so there might be multiple SYs that are compatible with a single SX. Okay, now we are going to figure out how we prevent this from collapsing when we train. But basically, that's the JEPA, Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture. And this is not just for learning representations of, of images or video, this is also for uh, building predictive world models, okay? This is the state of the world at time t, this is the state of the world at time t plus one, and I'm trying to predict some abstract representation of the state of the world at time t plus one from the state of the world at time t, perhaps with the help of some latent variable in a predictor. So if I can train something like this efficiently, perhaps I can build world models. Um, so contrastive methods are boring, so let me skip, and also well known. Uh, they work though, very well for speech recognition, for uh, image recognition. You can train with like very large training sets, pre-train, self-supervised, and then fine-tune. Um, there's this uh, speech recognition system called uh, XLSR, which is a few years old, but basically is pre-trained in a, with a self-supervised uh, method uh, on a kind of a relatively small data set. And then um, you can fine-tune it and basically get a really good f uh, speech recognition system with only 10 minutes of labeled data, which is amazing. Okay, this is the, this is the cool stuff, regularized method for joint embedding architectures. Um, so what are we gonna do here to train this thing? Here is the idea, and this also connects with a lot of stuff Yima has been uh, saying for, for, for a bit, uh, which is that the collapse is caused, maybe caused by the fact, for, by two things. The first thing that can cause a collapse is the fact that SX and SY are not informative about X and Y. So if SX is constant and SY is constant, then prediction error is zero, and the energy is zero everywhere in the space, not a good model, okay? So what you wanna do is basically maximize the information content that SX contains about X and that SY contains about Y. So have some measure of information and maximize it, okay? These are cost functions, so there's a minus sign in front because we, we minimize them. And the second way this model can collapse is if the Z variable has too much capacity, so too high dimension or whatever, the set that you can vary over is too large, and so it can make the prediction error zero because you, know, you can always choose a value of the latent variable that will make the prediction of SY be equal to SY. So you need to regularize that and by something that sort of minimizes its, its information content. So here you want to maximize the information content, here you want to minimize the information content, somehow. Uh, a number of different methods have been proposed to do this, so things like uh, BYOL, WMAC, and then two that um, came out of my, my group at, uh, at FAIR, Barlow Twins and VicRag. Let me talk about VicRag, because I think it's really cool. So the way you maximize the information content here of uh, the output of the encoder is that you forget about this module for now, you, you feed it to two cost functions. One cost function tries to make the variance of each individual variable coming out of this encoder one, okay, above a certain threshold, okay, using a hinge loss. So you have a hinge loss on the variance over a batch of each variable coming out of, of this thing. So it makes sure they don't collapse to zero. Now, that is not sufficient because they could still be very highly correlated with each other. So there's a second term that tries to decorrelate them, okay? Basically make the off-diagonal term uh, equal to zero. Um, and you do this for both SX and SY, uh, and then you have some way of regularizing Z, which I'm not gonna go into at the, at the moment. So 
Various ways to do this. Uh, this is a particular way of doing it. Uh, uh, e actually has another method for doing it, which is very similar. That's based on uh, essentially forcing the covariance matrix of the representations coming out of the encoder to be as close to the identity as possible, which is very similar to this criterion, which equals MCR squared, if I'm not wrong. Maximum coding rate reduction. Um, okay, and this stuff, VicRag, works quite well for uh, pre-training uh, image recognition system. So this is a whole bunch of self-supervised running methods of various types. And this is, uh, the, the first column here is what uh, accuracy do you get on ImageNet if you pre-train a system like this on ImageNet using data augmentation. Uh, so basically you're forcing uh, distorted versions of the, of, two image, of, of the same image to map to the same representation. There's no predictor in there, it's, it's just uh, equal. And, uh, um, and so many of those methods are contrastive um, and, and a few of them are not. So BYOL and Barlow Twin and VCREG are not contrastive. Swab is somewhere in between, so it's kind of complicated. Um, and this works really well. So, um, you know, they're all kind of in the 73, 74% correct. Uh, Swab uh, in this particular SEVO experiment is a little above because it uses something called multi-crop that the other ones uh, don't take advantage of. And this can also uh, be used for uh, transfer learning, so you get good performance on other tasks that uh, the system is not pre-trained on. But here's the big advantage of, of VCRAG, which is that it does not require any of the tricks that other, the other methods like BYO or SIMSIAM uh, require. So you don't need to uh, do batch norm, you don't need to share the weights between the two things, you don't need the exponential moving average thing that you know, I didn't talk about the, what, they call, what they call the momentum encoder here, and stop gradient, and all kinds of tricks. You, you can just use it by itself and it doesn't collapse. Which means you can use two different encoders that have nothing to do with each other and you can apply VCREG to different modalities, not just images, but pairs of, of things. Um, okay. Um, coming back to the uh, world modeling, uh, here is how we could use those JEPA architectures, trained using self-supervised learning, basically by observation, uh, to um, be used for as a world model, but in a hierarchical manner. So what we need to do when we do planning is that we need to be able to represent the world at different levels of abstraction, so that at the low level of abstraction, we can make accurate short-term predictions. But those predictions are likely to diverge very quickly from reality. Whereas at a high level of abstraction, we describe the world with uh, fewer details, many fewer details, but that allows us to make predictions that are more accurate uh, in that representational world. So for example, uh, if I tell you, um, you know, I'm, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to go to San Francisco uh, tonight, which I'm not actually, I'm going to stay in Berkeley, but, um, you know, you can't simulate every muscle in my body millisecond by millisecond to predict, you know, every step of the way. But you can say that, you know, if I decide to leave for, uh, for San Francisco now, I'll probably be in San Francisco, you know, sometimes within an hour or so. And if I go by car, I'll have to take the Bay Bridge and blah, blah, blah. I mean, so you can describe the, the, the situation at a high level fairly accurately. Um, and you don't have to deal with all the uncertainty or the details that you just cannot know. But you can predict, you know, within a few milliseconds where your body is going to be because you basically, uh, you know, it's high dimensional information, but, but you have control over it. Um, so this hierarchical JEPA, when you sort of turn it into a kind of a world model uh, in the type of architecture I was talking about earlier, uh, can be used for hierarchical planning. So here is my idea of the state of the world at one level of abstraction. I can run it through a second level of encoder that gives me a more abstract representation of the state of the world. And my cost function here is the distance to, uh, I don't know, the restaurant I want to go to in San Francisco or something like that. Okay, so that's my objective. Uh, and the first thing is, you know, I take, uh, um, I need to take the train and then get off the train at the right station. So this uh, action will go into a cost that indicates how far from the train station I am or something. 
Okay, so essentially the specification, an action here is not an action, it's a condition that this, this system must satisfy, described at a high level. And the second level of planning will uh, use this condition as a cost to be minimized by its own actions. How do I get to the train station? Okay, I gotta get out of this building and then walk to the train station. Um, so that my predictor can predict this and I can come up with a sequence of action and then I can go all the way down to millisecond by millisecond muscle control. So this issue, we have not built this yet. Um, this issue of hierarchical planning is completely unsolved as far as I know in, uh, in, uh, in control or robotics or machine learning unless the intermediate concepts are pre-specified. Uh, of course, in the real world, you have latent variables because the world is not entirely predictable. You know, is the light going to be red? Is the train going to be late? You know, things like that. So you need to have latent variables to deal with multiple possible scenarios here. But we're coming to the end here. So what are the steps towards autonomous AI systems? Basically getting self-supervised learning to work. And I think the criterion for this is can we train a system from video by basically watching videos? Can we train a system to figure out how the world works by just watching videos um, and do a good job at maybe video prediction? Although the, the goal here is not prediction, it's joint embedding. Um, I think handling uncertainty in prediction can be done with joint embedding predictive architectures, particularly the hierarchical type, and the, using the energy based model framework, which uh, I think is more tractable than insisting on, on, on modeling distributions. Um, can we learn world models from observation or do we need a certain level of interaction? At some point we'll need a system to interact, uh, if nothing else, to correct its world model for situations that, where it hasn't been really trained properly. The idea of reasoning and planning here, uh, basically reasoning is reduced to the idea of finding a sequence of actions or latent variables that minimize uh, a cost. Um, and the nice thing about this is that this is compatible with uh, gradient-based learning with deep learning. So this is very much unlike, uh, you know, logical reasoning of the sort of, you know, good old-fashioned AI type. Uh, this is more, you know, using gradients and information and stuff like that to figure out like an optimal sequence of action to satisfy uh, a cost. And this is very much inspired by classical optimal control. Okay, so what about this uh, mysterious configurator module that I was telling you about uh, earlier? Uh, so the configurator here would be a module that configures the other modules, so modulates their weights, for example, or feed you know, some extra tokens to transformers or whatever, to basically get the system to focus on a particular task. Okay, so you are, uh, I don't know, looking for uh, a pair of scissors in a drawer, and your visual cortex is configured to detect the pair of scissors, uh, and you know, your entire cost, uh, you know, modul modulable uh, cost is focused on actually accomplishing the task of grabbing the, the scissor. And so you can, you know, focus on kind of a conscious task, if I, if I can call it this way, uh, you know, by uh, configuring all the modules for that uh, particular task and then kind of switch to another task. This configurator will sort of be the sort of executive control of all of that, would sort of configure the modules. I don't know how to build this, okay. Maybe we'll put you know, some sort of transformer and backpropagate gradients and it'll work, but I don't know, all right? Um, uh, the associative memory would be some sort of uh, you know, key value kind of thing. Uh, uh, so here is the interesting thing. There's a hypothesis perhaps or, or a speculation, uh, perhaps you'll tell me I'm completely wrong, but um, a speculation that would be that uh, we only have one world model in our head or prefrontal cortex basically is a world model and it's configurable for the task at hand. But we only have one, one such engine, which means that, which explains why we can only accomplish one conscious task at any one time because we have to devote our prefrontal cortex to that task and it can't be used for anything else while we're doing this. We can do a lot of subconscious tasks simultaneously, mode one, but mode two, we can only do one at a time. Um, there is an advantage to having a single world model that is configurable, which is that that world model can share knowledge among multiple uh, tasks. Uh, things like the basic physics of the world doesn't change depending on which task you're accomplishing. 
So that's the final slide. Prediction really is the essence of intelligence. It's not RL. It's not reward. Reward is not enough. Um, and I think learning predictive models is the world uh, of the world is the basis of common sense in the end. Uh, uh, HJPA with non contrastive training, I think, are the thing going forward. I might be wrong. Um, intrinsic cost and architectures drive behavior and determine what the agent will learn, and I think is true in biology as well. Um, and here is something funny that's also completely speculative, but. Uh, Emotions would be necessary for such autonomous intelligent systems because emotions, many emotions, are basically anticipation of outcomes. Uh, and so this is what the, the critic computes, right? It sort of anticipates whether an outcome would be good or bad. And that creates things like fear and elation and things like that, right? So I don't believe, uh, you know, the kind of sci-fi cliche that, you know, robots don't have emotions. Uh, ultimately, if they have autonomous intelligence, they will have to have emotions. It's inseparable. And perhaps another speculation is consciousness exists because we only have one world model engine. If we had a few thousands, then we wouldn't need consciousness. So it's a result of a limitation of our brain, not its power. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Uh, questions? Do I see? Okay, I'm maybe not the right person for this. Ah. No. Okay. Oh. Yeah, Jan. What about large language models? <laughs> <laughs> I, large I want language. to give you the soapbox. Yeah, okay. So large language models don't have latent variables. They don't have explicit world models, although they kind of have some implicit model of the world that is trained from text. But I think that most of human knowledge actually is not present in any text. So a lot of physical knowledge that we have about everyday, everyday life, I think constitutes most of the knowledge that we have in our brains, that we learn when we we're babies. And it's certainly, uh, and it's, it's not linguistic at all. And it's not present in any text uh, ever written. Uh, it's certainly true also of uh, animal knowledge. Animal knowledge is non-linguistic, mostly. So, uh, so I don't think we'll arrive at sort of human-level intelligence by just training larger and larger uh, large language models. We need grounding. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> but rather uh, also to enhance learning. So for example, if I present you images, and one of the, some of the images are like rocks and cars, and I present to you a really like grotesque image, right? Your learning and your memory of that image is gonna be a lot more salient, uh, but the, it's still an image at the end of the day, right? So I'm proposing that you know, that slide, that bullet point is missing something. It's not just the anticipation, it's also the, the saliency of, uh, of you know, how fast something's being learned. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of details that are, that are sort of left out in this model, and, and they could be specialized in various ways. And one in particular could be to uh, emphasize learning on, first of all, on examples that violate the, the model, right? So like the little girl I showed at the beginning, you know, she gets surprised when the, the, the little car doesn't fall. Uh, she pays attention because you need to adjust your model of the world when something surprising occurs, right? But also when something sort of potentially emotionally uh, important uh, occurs, you need to pay attention. Uh, and the reason is because emotions are anticipation of outcomes. And if the outcome is not going to be what you expected, you need to pay attention. And, uh, you know, or, or if something, you know, caused uh, like, you know, pain, uh, you kind of pay attention to it and you remember not to do the same thing for that reason. So yeah, I agree, emotions will modulate learning. So my next question is, can you give an example of how a model like this would learn names? So for example, specifically if I ask this model, this modeling system, what is my name? Like how would it kind of learn to answer that question? 
So that would be, um, so that's the easy part. Uh, language models can do this, um, and then you know the ones particularly that can sort of you know store values in associative memories can do this. So that's the that's the stuff we can do easily with computers, right? And that humans are not particularly good at, by the way. So uh, you know, so individual factual memory is not not that great in, in humans. The capacity of our memory is rather small. Well, I guess the the problem I'm thinking about is if I ask a model like this, what is my name? Yeah. Like the, the answer I expect is not like my actual name, but rather, oh, I don't know what your name is. What is yeah. your name, right? Oh, well, so th this, this would heavily rely on this uh, short-term associative memory that, I mean, it's not necessarily short-term, but the associative memory module that I didn't really talk about much. So presumably that kind of information would be stored there. And then the action would be produce the name you know, from the perception. So the prompt would be sort of a, a question, so it would be access the memory um, to return. And we know how to do this already. That's kind of the easy part. Maybe one more question. All right. Um, so in the beginning, you talked about how an RL approaches, like the car would have to fall off the mountain like many, many times. Um, and we humans don't have to do that. But I was wondering how you see that um, from the perspective of like evolution, where arguably there were some really stupid proto-humans maybe who fell off cliffs and we evolved to be better. So like um, all of these modules are like hard-coded, but um, maybe like should they be more evolutionary? Like, weight agnostic neural networks or something. Like, how do you view that? I mean, I don't think proto-humans were falling off cliffs, you know, any more than your cat falls off a cliff. So, uh, I mean, that, that thing was figured out by evolution a long time ago, I think. Um, I mean, cats have, a, have an amazing dynamical model of themselves, right? I mean, they can do amazing things. Uh, and, and a lot of, you know, very, sim you know, much simpler animals. You know, a mouse has, you know, a few tens of millions of neurons and can do pretty amazing things. Uh, so you don't need like, you know, gigantic, enormous brains for that. Um, I think it's more a question of what's the right architecture, what's the right paradigm for learning, how do you handle uncertainty, how do you get the system to focus on the right amount of information, what are good measures of information content to be optimized by those techniques I talked about. Or perhaps I'm completely wrong and there's a completely different, uh, you know, approach to, to all of this. Um, but then I'd like to know what it is. Okay, I think we're out of time. We want to thank Jan for a really inspiring talk. Thank you.